Bookcase TV is brought to you in part by Cafe Tallula. Digital Film Academy. Um, give me a second. I want to make sure that uh, no one's going to call me as I'm talking. So uh, we'll see if I can get through it, okay? Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Bookcase TV for a new episode. Uh, one of the major drawbacks of working and doing investigation in Manhattan is uh, the tendency for people who actually live there to forget that there is a world outside of the island. Indeed, everyone seems to converge into Manhattan since it is, after all, the center of the universe of the publishing industry. But once a year here at Bookcase TV, we actually venture out of Manhattan and we go across the East Side River to a place called Brooklyn to see what's happening there on the literary front. We've discovered that every year there is a pretty phenomenal book fair and we discover also that they have a lot of writers from all parts of the world converging there. We've met this um, incredible Mexican writer who talks about the drug problem in Mexico. We met an Egyptian writer who's been migrating to the States and talk about the problem of identity and also someone from the Deep South, which is also not in Manhattan, but talking about the Great Migration, if you remember what it is. So let's go and meet them, and for that, of course, we send our favorite and best investigator to do the job. So welcome back to Bookcase, and uh, our guest today is uh, actually a foreign guest, uh, Annabelle Hernandez, who has written this uh, amazing book, long long work on the investigation called Narcoland. So um, I read the book and there's a lot, to, I don't even know how to get started, there's so much in it, it's so packed. Um, your mission writing the book was what? Because you did not set up to write it just to know about the, the drug problem, but it was a bigger, a bigger implication for yourself. I really want that the, the, that the people know the truth about the war against the drugs in Mexico. I really discovered that that war was fate, was a shame. So this book uh, has a lot of stories, and you've been very good to uh, document uh, the life of Joaquim uh, Guzman, you know, the Chapo. How is it possible that some half country peasants can become so powerful? Well, that was really the point of my investigation. I, I discovered that uh, El Chapo Guzman is a man who has to leave the school when he was just seven years old. Mm -hmm. He's a very primitive man. He's violent. He consumes drugs. He rapes women. I mean, he's just one bad guy more in, 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 in the middle of hundreds mm -hmm. of men like, like, like him. So I really want to understand why this guy became this, uh, uh, the, the most powerful drug lord in the story. I discovered that um, this man was uh, created by the corruption of the government in Mexico. First, the government thought that they can control to these medium gangs that just used, used to traffic uh, marijuana and heroin to USA. And at the end of the story, I mean right now, now the drug cartels control the government. The, the, by reading the book, you get a sense like Mexico is becoming a bit like uh, Italy with the, the mafia. And uh, when I read it, I was thinking about Roberto Salvano, who actually wrote uh, the foreword in your book who is uh, just like you, uh, investigating the, the drug problem. So do you think it's this, this is sort of um, drug cartel is becoming so powerful and it, it's going all around the world and infiltrating power and taking over or controlling it? The model of the mafia is almost the same in each country. First, corrupt the government. Mm. They, they try to break the state. They also try to corrupt to the society. For example, the businessman, the banks, mm. 
that uh, le that help them to dra to laundry their their money in all the mm -hmm. world. When you read this book, Narcoland, you will discover that the problem in Mexico is not just the problem in Mexico. Of course, yeah. The problem of this big, huge drug cartel is the problem also of USA and many other countries in the world. I mean, this mafia works everywhere. The, the election after Vicente Fox, yeah. right, when uh, Felipe Calderón yeah. came to power, do you think the, the, the situation worsened, got worse? The government used to protect to all the cartels. I mean, each cartel has their own piece of the cake. But when Vicente Fox uh, became the first president of a party different than the PRI, he broke the game. And he started to protect to the Sinaloa cartel mm -hmm. and their partners and use the power of the state against the, car the enemy cartels of the Sinaloa cartel. Why, why it's for you to do all that work? Why do you feel so committed to, to reveal all that? And which is very honorable, but at the same time, you have one life. I'm not the only Mexican that believes that the things have to change. So I'm just a part of the society mm -hmm. that said no to the corruption and really that the, that part of the society want to fight against that because we can, we, we, uh, I really want to, to see my child grow up. Why, why targeting you then? Well, uh, what I did in my investigation is uh, discover name by name yeah. in the government and which businessmen are involved with the drug cartels. That is more dangerous yeah. than say the name of El Chapo Guzman because everyone knows no. who is El Chapo Guzman but not mm. everyone knows that this businessman is involved that this senator is involved, mm -hmm. that this chief of police is involved. So that, for me, that was very important, not just talk about El Chapo Guzman, because everyone knows him. What did you think you learned about yourself through the process of doing that book? Well, I, I really learned that the, the people that protect to the Chapo Guzman is more dangerous than the Chapo Guzman, because the Chapo Guzman is just one, yeah. one man. The other people are too many people in the most important places in the, in, in the, in the, in the life of, Mex of Mexico. Mm -hmm. That people is more dangerous because even you kill tomorrow to El Chapo Guzman, these people will, will always find another person to, 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 replace, to, him. to replace him. But before we talk about uh, Harvard and the square in Harvard, why being a writer? Uh, as opposed to be a mathematician. <laughs> as opposed to being a lawyer, which well, I wish right. I could have been. But you still have to write uh, the memo. It can be pretty complex and technical. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that writing is, a, is a something one does because one wants to do it. I don't think one has to do it, but one wants to do it. And I've always wanted to be a writer since I was a kid. Eventually, I decided to, maybe it was time to take myself seriously, since this is what I was claiming I wanted to do. And at the age of 40, I started publishing. Identity mm. its a big part of your writing. Yes. I mean, Harvard Square is a lot about identity as well. And then you make I mean, it very pronounced, because there is a duality between two different worlds. Um, how does this uh, come into play in your daily life? When I'm writing, I'm writing about somebody who feels ill at ease with the language that he's writing in, in the country that he happens to be. I was always ill at ease in every country I've lived. I never felt I belonged to any community that I was part of or was asked to be part of. Uh, all these things, and I've, the profession I practice, I'm not quite comfortable with it either. Mm -hmm. And so I make these, I'm, I sort of expose and put on display these problems when I'm writing. Harvard Square. Yeah. Why, why, why did you have to write it? I wrote it because somebody asked me to give a performance of a character that I had met that was very interesting. It was the moth. Okay. And they asked me to do oh, this. The moth reading. Yes. Okay, yeah. They asked me to do this. And so I discussed it with them. And I realized as I was telling them the story, 
as a kind of rehearsal of what kind of person I would be in front of an audience, I realized I don't know how to speak. I can't tell a story this way. I can only tell a story in writing. Mm -hmm. So I decided to bag the whole idea of the moth and to just write a short story about Kalashnikov. And eventually the thing morphed into a long novella, which became, was published. And then I decided to write a novel about him. I mean, you're very open about uh, this dual character that you have, one being critical of the modern world. Yes. And, and so that, that must, a part of you must feel that on a daily basis, you know? Um, I, what I've done is uh, I've exaggerated the critique of America. Okay. And what was uh, the purpose of doing that? Because the character, well, because the character yeah. really yeah. did exist. I wanted to convey this, this, these tirades that he would go into. And to do that, I had to frame a language and frame a discourse and frame a plot. Uh, but in, in point of fact, there was a whole vision that he has of America. And in order to get into his skin, I had to understand what it is that he felt. Mm -hmm. and, and I also was another, char I was another character as well. I was myself in the book uh, as a graduate student who belonged to Harvard, who loved Harvard and got to like it even more. And now I adore it. Do you think Harvard turned you into a Jumbo uh, Herzat? I think at the end of the book, I become Jumbo Herzat. I sell out. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I do is that I sort of turn my back on this good friend who was a good friend. Is there like a nostalgic looking back of uh, when the world was more, uh, was clearer uh, at the root of the novel a little bit? Well, because we, it's a big flashback. It, the novel is written as a flashback. Yeah, yes, but it doesn't start. I mean, he, he goes back. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was feel like when you had the Cold War, the Russian, the communist. Uh, it was clear. The, it was, there was a clarity about it. And you knew where you fit or you didn't fit or you were striding both. And now everything is a bit it's foggy. Now everything is foggy. Well, I, ironically, it's at the time, everything was foggy. I, okay. I wanted to be in France, and I was stuck in Cambridge. I had no business being in Cambridge. I wanted to be in France. I wanted to be in Paris. And he wanted to be back in France. So both of us were like homesick for France. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in a bar. It d didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was very foggy. Nowadays, I think my career path has been relatively good. I'm happy with it. Now, you, I, know, I saw on the program you're doing um, a panel on um, Surveillance, uh, yes. digital surveillance. Um, you feel like you're being watched, or you feel like you're being giving your li your privacy away? You know what? The answer to this is I don't know if I'm being watched. Mm. I don't. I mean, I frequently look up Arabic words on the net. What is the word for this in Arabic? Uh, I'm sure that every time I put in a word in Arabic, in so somebody picks it up somewhere and they say, "Oh, this guy is looking up too many words in Arabic. What's going on?" I don't know what's going on. Uh, are they uh, s surveying me? I don't know. Does that bother you? That I might be? Yes. I think yes. Most of us have things that we don't want to be made public. And the internet is the first thing we have where we sort of put our lives out, if only by the searches we make. If you're making a search on A and B and C, somebody will put them together and understand what you are really trying to do. I don't know who is watching over me, and I don't like that feeling. You teach students? Yeah. Do you see a difference in the way already they think compared to whether the way you perceive the world because they're part of the digital uh, era generation? No, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe when I start teaching, I bring them into my world and my mm -hmm. sphere and maybe my chronology so that they abandon theirs for a moment. But half the time that I'm teaching, I know people are texting. I look good, right? <laughs> uh, we are back in Bookcase TV. My guest is already making fun of me. Uh, Ayanna Matisse, who has a novel, the first novel, I believe, there, The Twelve Tribes of Hati. Uh, you come from the Aowa workshop, the writer's workshop. Correct. And I feel like now if you want to get published almost, you have to go through that channel. Is that, is that what your intention when you went to uh, Iowa? No, no, yeah. not at all. Okay. I, I kind of, um, I went to the workshop sort of later than most people do. I was 36 when I went there. And That's your baby. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Compared to us, it's In comparison, <laughs> though, you know, everyone's 24, right. you know. 
So you felt like an outcast, you were too old, and then everyone was <laughs> young. So what was your experience apart from I that? I had a great experience there. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I was certainly older. There were a bunch of us in my graduating class that were kind of a little bit older. Not, not that many of us, maybe five or so. I didn't go there with the intention of sort of I'm going to publish a novel and et cetera. I never really had kind of careerist aspirations. I just knew that I wanted to write a book at some point and it wasn't working with my magazine life in Brooklyn and I didn't have time and I couldn't write. And so it seemed the biggest thing was that it was a gift of, of time and resources. And I was sort of taken out of New York and popped into the middle of the Midwest and had some financial support and time. It sounds almost like a midlife crisis, not knowing where to it go was, next. Yeah. Uh, well, it, was, it wasn't that I didn't know. I, I, uh, as I said, I've been writing all my life. It was just that writing, I had always sort of put it on various back burners. Mm. And it became um, apparent, I'm not sure why, in my mid-30s that, that I needed to make it much more of a focus. And I couldn't quite figure out how to do it here. Yeah. But what interested you about writing about the past, something you've never lived through? Um, I think, well, I, I'm obsessed with Philadelphia, okay. so it, that's sort of the, the one thing. Um, I, I, I was sort of raised with this kind of mid-century sensibility, I think, you know, without even really knowing it, even though my own kind of understanding of the world obviously is quite different. I wasn't born until the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I had sort of a great curiosity and obsession about that period in particular. So the 12 tribes of Hatti, mm -hmm. um, who is Hatti, or what is Hatti, or where mm -hmm. is Hatti, mm -hmm. you know, it's, <laughs> a great, it's a great title, so uh, who is she? The backdrop of the novel is the Great Migration. Um, Hattie leaves Georgia in 1923. She's 15 years old. She goes to Philadelphia with her family. They flee. Um, her father has been killed in racial violence, and they leave. And she gets to Philadelphia, and she marries a man. By the time she's 17, when the novel opens and we meet her, she, it's 1925. She's married. She's only 17. She has twins already. She's this um, very stoic, very difficult figure in some ways. She's just not the easiest person to love. I love her. I think she's wonderful. And she, but she's very layered and she's very complicated. And so she raises her children not with a kind of, you know, milk and cookies and kisses kind of love. Um, she raises them much more um, with an eye to the way that she thinks that the world will receive them, which is um, not with kindness. And so she sort of raises them to be tough. Be tough. She herself is, yeah. is quite tough. And obviously there's an evolution of the character, so the story and then... Yes. The yes. So uh, how... The, where, who is she model after? I mean, is something you made up, or you, you had a piece of your mother, or some she, chunk of your grandmother, or um, people you knew? Or is she like a composite? I think that more than being a composite, or, or even sort of directly modeled after anybody, she was um, inspired, I guess might be a better word for her, by my grandmother. But my grandmother was, um, she was quite stoic in, in the way that Hattie is, but much less prone to rages mm -hmm. <laughs> than, 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 than this character Hattie is. So what, what, what was uh, the the turning point for you to decide to, to write that type of character? You know, when I started writing the book, I, I didn't really realize I was writing a book. I thought that I was writing a series of short stories. And the short stories were um, sort of the important thing to know about the book is so Hattie is the, kind of the lifeblood of the, of the, of the novel, and she's its, she's its through line. But the chapters are each named after one of her children, and we meet one of those kids at some point in his or her life. They're not children when we meet them, they're adults. And Hattie appears in each chapter. She's present, and, and that's sort of how the arc of her life grows. The chapters move forward chronologically. It's a good migration for her. Well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I didn't necessarily realize that I was writing about Hattie. Uh, I thought that I was writing about the children. And then she sort of kept appearing. And, then I, and I also realized that she was what united them. And as I realized that, I thought, oh, OK, well, maybe this novel is, is actually about this woman, which I don't think it's about, about her more than it's about her children. And I started to think that I had to shift focus and kind of make it um, something more um, linear or, or to have something with more of a conventional narrative arc that, that sort of had her as its focus. But I realized that she was she's very complicated. And there was no way for me to know her by approaching her head on, she needed to be approached through the prism of her children's experience of her. And I'm sure still uh, people feel unknowable at the end, you know? I think so. I, think so. I, don't, I still mysteries. don't know her. And uh, before we started talking you know, on camera, you were mentioning about the opera. So mm -hmm. there was a mysterious uh, great migration mm -hmm. to select you as well. Right. <laughs> Did you obviously you got to meet her? And, uh, yes, and, yes. Uh, what was a, a process I mean, to know that you were selected on your first novel? It must have been pretty uh, miraculous, no? Everybody, I think in these days, editors often will send novels to O Magazine, which is yeah, the Oprah right, Magazine, yeah. because it's, it's one of the few glossies that does extensive book oh, coverage. Yeah, yeah. So everybody sends all their books there. So mine got sent. 
Okay. And um, in hopes that you know we would get a review or something. And uh, we didn't even really know that she was, that Oprah was looking for a book club selection at that time. So it got sort of sent off. Uh -huh, and yeah. then she chose it. Ayanna Mathis, the 12 Troubles of Hattish. And thank you for being on Bookcase TV. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Since we've crossed the river and we're in Brooklyn, I thought maybe we should investigate a new type of publishing companies. And I'm not talking about small company, micro publishers uh, or large ones, some companies that have access to bookstores and have a huge network online to sell ebooks. I'm talking about different breed of companies, a type of company that is coming along more and more, and they are non-for-profit publishing companies. So what are they? Why are they deciding to go into a non-for-profit when this whole business seems to be profit-driven? What sort of a project they take on? Well, I think we should go and find out. You are sort of a different type of a house, uh, publishing house because you're not for profit. Yes, for us I knew we're, we're focused on international literature, exclusively okay. international literature. I really don't want to do books just because I think they'll do well. So if we made ourselves a not for profit, then we can raise money. Actually, a th maybe a third of our book sale, a third of our income comes from book sales. Okay. The other two thirds comes from foundations, individual donations, um, private foundations. Publishing books was not big enough. You had to have this massive load of fundraising. Yes. So you, I mean, so you're uh, 501. Or 501c3. So you have a board of director. Yes. And you started as a non-for-profit right away, or you yes. went for profit? We started out. We knew from the beginning we wanted to make it a not-for-profit. The future of uh, Archipelago. Wh what is it? Well, I hope we'll be able to get more, more and more books. And we still want to do about ten books a year. Uh, we don't want to do many more than that because I feel that's just the right amount. So as you can see, if you want to publish high quality literature and have books that look like very uh, artistically orientated and minded, the only way to do that in these days, given the, the conjecture and the financial pressure to turn a profit all the time, is to create a non-for-profit company. If you're interested, you know how to get started now. So now you've seen what's happening uh, at the Brooklyn Book Festival. We can also show you the book of uh, some of the writers we did not get a chance to interview there, but uh, we have received that book. The first one was Ursula de Young, Shaw Cliff, uh, a first novel which is garnering a lot, a lot of attention for its uh, quality of writing. Uh, Shaw Cliff, it's a big mansion, I suppose you could say, in Maine, where a 13-year-old boy called Richard is facing with a new reality, and that is learning about his family. Uh, they have secrets, they are harboring a lot of uh, resentment, uh, love of each other, and in particular it comes to term with uh, the difficult question of uh, how far his loyalty is to his family with his uncle Kurt, who is having a sort of a clandestine life. Ursula de Young, first novel, fantastic. The next book, it's uh, Biblio Death by Andrei Kordescu. Andrei Kordescu that you must certainly know uh, for being on NPR, all things considered since I think the early 80s. It's a very surprising book from a tiny micro publisher based in Austin, Texas called uh, the Anti Book Club. And they, I'm very surprised that actually Andrew Koresko decided to go with them for this book. It's called uh, Biblio Death, and it's basically an anti memoir where Andrew makes his point against the Prophet of Doom's thinking maybe the book is going to die, that actually we are in transition periods and the book, the written word, is still going to prevail by a different platform. So this is uh, his reflection, quite an inter intellectual reflection, but a very convincing one. Biblio Death by Andrei Kodrescu, a, an expatriate uh, Romanian writer. And I'm saying this because my next book is about a real Romanian who still lives in Romania, Mircea Catarescu. Uh, blinding, fantastic, uh, dreamlike novel, more like a phantasmagoria almost, uh, about a kaleidoscopic uh, landscape of his life. So it's like a part driven memoir, part uh, dream memoir, and we go from his childhood, him working in a circus and uh, going with the parents, his hospitalization uh, in Romania, the arrival of the communist regime, uh, the zombie army, and it's all very um, fragmented, but also more like a pilgrimage of um, the dream landscape. The dream landscape that will actually 
suck you in and will make you very experience the very thing he's experiencing. So Blinding by Musha Katarescu, uh, fabulous read. And my last book of the day is The Sound of Things Falling. Uh, we've been talking about um, Annabel Hernandez in Mexico about the drug problem, now we are in Colombia. And this is very interesting because uh, the book opens with uh, the disappearance of a hippopotamus. And this hippopotamus used to belong to Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar had a zoo, in fact, he, was, he loved animals. So after he got um, gotten rid of, the zoo was left to his own device. Most of the animals died, but the hippopotamus escaped. And this leads our hero onto a quest of, um, to a study of violence and the impact he has on family and his friends, especially when they get killed for drug-related problem and through life. So a beautiful journey through time, recollections, the sound of things falling, Juan Gabriel Vasquez. And this concludes our um, exotic tour uh, outside of Manhattan in Brooklyn for the Book World Festival.